Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Gessel, and I am the Director of Public Programs at Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. MOAD is a contemporary art museum, and our exhibitions and programming inspire learning through the global lens of the African diaspora. I want to acknowledge the challenging circumstances that still remain, even as our spaces begin to open up and expand. MOAD stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter in recognizing and condemning white supremacy and the ongoing systemic violence against Black people. We honor and mourn the senseless murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Andre Hill, Dante Wright, and Micaiah Bryant. We grieve for so many others who have lost their lives at the hands of state-sanctioned violence, including those whose names we do not know. We want to acknowledge that MOAD's commitment to racial justice is ongoing, and as such, we will continue to say their names, to hold space, and to honor these victims. As many of us are settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent, our institutions were founded upon exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples on whose land we are located. With deep respect, MOAD acknowledges that even in virtual space, we reside on unceded land, native lands and thank the Ramatush and Chochenyo Ohlone peoples of the Bay Area who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. Thank you for joining us today with a special acknowledgement for MOAD members and those of you who have donated to the museum during the pandemic. We are so grateful for your support. Today, we're here to celebrate Loving Day with a conversation about Joan Steino Lester's new memoir, Loving Before Loving, A Marriage in Black and White. Joan will be in conversation with writer Sarah Ladipo-Manika, and it's my pleasure to introduce them to you. Dr. Joan Steino Lester is the award-winning author of six critically praised books, including the memoir, Loving Before Loving. A member of a biracial family, she explores racial riptides in all of her writing, from her essays, in the future of white men and the other diversity dilemmas to the novels, Black, White, Other, and Mama's Child. Dr. Lester's essays have appeared in numerous publications, including the Chicago Tribune, Los Angeles Times, San Francisco Chronicle, USA Today, and Washington Post, and many more, as well as multiple radio commentaries. She won the National Lesbian and Gay Journalists Seigenthaler Award for an All Things Considered Commentary, the Susan Arafat Arts and Letters Finalist Award for Creative Nonfiction, and the Bellwether for Socially Engaged Fiction Finalist Award. The San Francisco Women's Heritage Museum nominated Taking Charge for a Best Women's Book, and the Washington Post singled out her Eleanor Holmes Norton biography, Fire in My Soul, for its top listed, What Washingtonians Are Reading. Dr. Lester has delivered keynotes, spoken on panels, and led workshops at hundreds of conferences over a 40-year career of national public speaking. She lives in Berkeley, California with her wife of 40 years. And she will be in conversation with Sarah Ladipo Manika, who was raised in Nigeria and has lived in Kenya, France, Zimbabwe, and England. Sarah is a novelist, short story writer, and essayist, and founding books editor for Aussie.com. Her debut novel, Independence, is an international bestseller, while her second novel, Like a Mule Bringing Ice Cream to the Sun, has been translated into a number of languages. Her nonfiction includes personal essays and intimate profiles of people she meets, from Mrs. Harris and Pastor Evan Mawarire to Toni Morrison, Margaret Busby, and Michelle Obama. Sarah previously served on MOAD's board and currently serves as board president for the Women's Writing Residency Hedgebrook. Sarah is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, a San Francisco Public Library laureate, and a member of the National Books Critics Circle. So please join me in welcoming today, Joan Steinel Lester and Sarah Ladipo Manika. Elizabeth, thank you so much. And um, thank you to the audience, all the, those who support MOAD and uh, those who are lovers of books. It's great to have you here. And Joan, it's lovely to see you virtually. 
and to be celebrating today your latest book, Loving Before Loving, A Marriage in Black and White. Uh, Joan, the book that you have written is multi-layered um, and it uh, addresses a number of things, and, but at, at its core is a story about a relationship, a love affair that you had with a black man and a marriage that you entered before uh, multiracial, interracial marriage was decriminalized in America. And I thought we would just start with your title, Loving Before Loving, which is a nod to that landmark um, civil rights decision by the Supreme Court in 1967, Loving versus Virginia, that decriminalized interracial marriage. And you have a lovely passage in your book uh, that describes the moment that this happened and the impact it had on you. So let's, let's start with the title of the book and, and that segment. Oh, thank you. But before I uh, read that, I just wanna say thank you to you, uh, Sarah. It's such an honor uh, to be in conversation with you and thank you to Moad. I've been a longtime supporter and uh, admirer of the institution. So it's really a delight to be here today. I did select the title um, because that was such a significant decision in my life and nationally. And thank you, I would love to read uh, a page or two from the book. Early summer of 1967 brought good news. A legal case, Loving versus Virginia, was contesting Virginia's Racial Integrity Act of 1924, which criminalized interracial sex or marriage. Mildred Loving, described as Negro, and Richard Loving, described as white, had traveled from their Virginia home in 1958 to marry in Washington, DC, because of course they couldn't in Virginia. When they returned home, they were arrested by a sheriff shining a flashlight on their bed as they slept. Their marriage license was posted on the bedroom wall. I'm his wife, Mildred Loving protested, but the marriage was invalid in Virginia. Sentenced to a one year prison term, the couple fled the state and filed suit. They lost the first time in a US district court that announced, Almighty God created the races white, black, yellow, Malay, and red, and he placed them on separate continents, thereby demonstrating his segregationist intent. Many Virginians agreed with him, including some who burned a cross in the yard of Mildred Loving's mother. After Richard and Mildred lost again, this time in the Virginia Supreme Court, their ACLU lawyers appealed to the United States Supreme Court. And when his lawyers asked Richard what message he wanted to send, he said, tell them I love my wife. But on June 12, 1967, nine, I have to say nine long years after arrest for their marital crime, the United States Supreme Court issued a unanimous decision overturning their convictions and striking down anti-miscegenation laws. Mildred and Richard Loving were free with their children to finally return from exile and settle down again in the state they both called home. When I heard the decision on my kitchen radio, I yelled, yes, startling baby Rosa asleep in my lap. Yes, I said, yes, maybe now we can go south with daddy. We just became legal, a legal family from sea to shining sea. But of course, what I didn't know at the time was that laws I didn't fully appreciate in my twenties, laws are one thing and reality is another. Mm -hmm. So while it was a wonderful victory that has reverberated in all these decades since, on the ground, you know, forget it. I couldn't go up to a Mississippi sheriff and say, 
oh, but the law says, well, he's like, hello, who cares? Um, and we had known too many murdered civil rights workers to believe that it would now be safe for us to travel together. So I did not, mm -hmm. um, but our marriage was now legal nationally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, having laws passed as one step, isn't it? Yeah. It would be lovely if it, you could just sort of, you know, wave yeah. a magic wand and then everything else falls into place as well. Um, and you describe that sense and what you've just explained so well in your book, Joan. Um, you, you've been a lifelong activist on around many, many issues, <laughs> uh, but you're in a, I, I would think, a somewhat unique position of having gone through the marriage equality struggle and the struggle to legalize um, both marriage between so-called races and same-sex same partners. Um, so you've gone through this twice. Um, so I wanted to just talk about that for a minute before we come back to really sort of your, your life as an activist, which is just amazing, um, and ask you, are there some similarities and or differences mm -hmm. as you experience these two struggles for marriage equality. And I'm asking both societally and also your family's reactions. Thank you. There certainly are similarities in that in both cases at the time that I joined with this new partner, the partner I was joining with was a member of a despised minority because African Americans, Black people, then known as Negroes in polite society in the United States, in 1962 when I met Julius, well over 90, I think it was like 95% of people or maybe more disapproved of interracial marriage. Um, and that was one of the biggest arguments by white people against desegregating schools or any other kind of public accommodations, because they always said to white people, would you want your daughter to marry one? As if the answer was self-evident. So there was certainly the cultural opprobrium. Is that the right word? Opprobrium? I don't think I've ever used it before. Come on, Sarah. It, sound, it sounds fine. It sounds fine to me. <laughs> You're a writer, so we can even make up a word. Well, so are you. Oh, okay. So we get to make up words. Um, and my family, liberal though they were, and wonderful, wonderful people who were truly community minded and had brought me up to be, um, as we called it then, it was um, pro integration they were very upset, as were Julius's parents, um, for different reasons. My parents well, just thought I had lost my mind and they were very worried for me. And of course, the other big argument of white people was if you do get married or procreate with a black person, what about the children? That was always the classic line, the tragic I hate, even hate saying the word, but mulatto, which was the word used then. And I always slammed it down when I heard that word. Um, so my parents, my mother came to uh, the New York basement apartment that Julius and I shared. And she actually said, <laughs> shocking me, she said, we could have you committed like to a mental institution because this was so crazy. And I had just had an abortion with um, <laughs> the year before with another man, you know, I was 22 and she's like, you know, you're just off the deep end. Those two things were, were just evidence that I, I was not in my right mind. So they didn't come to my very small wedding. My brother came and my aunt and one or two friends. Julius's family also was very opposed to our wedding because remember in 1962, it's kind of shocking to realize that was only seven years after Emmett Till's murder, as well as countless others. So, you know, his father said to him, do not mess with white girls, you know, that'll get you killed. So both, of, both families were very opposed to our wedding, both of them being wonderful people, 
within six months. We did get married. Oh, and my mother also said this was kind of the kicker, which really was scary. She said, remember your father grew up in Kentucky. If you do marry Julius, he'll probably have a heart attack and die. And I loved my father very much. And I, I thought, you know, how could I kill my father? This was a terrible weight. So in both cases, you know, there was going to possibly be death. You know, from Julius's family, he might die. From my family, my father might die. But yet we did marry and um, nobody died. And within six months, my parents, whom I didn't speak to for a few months, came around. And before you knew it, they were buying whole cases of Malcolm X's autobiography, which had just come out then, and giving it away to friends and became huge activists and were picketing clan meetings and in Connecticut where they lived. And Julius's family also came around and was very warm to me. Uh, so it was very difficult. And it's it been interesting to watch now, how many years is that since 1962? That's almost 60 years, 59 years, mm -hmm. how much the culture has changed. Mm -hmm. um, I think I just read recently over 90% of people in the US when polled say they approve of interracial marriage, so-called interracial. Now in same-sex marriage, you know, in 1981, when Carol and I got together, gay people were also pretty much a despised minority. And, um, but my parents, by this time, they had become such activists in general. Also, my sister was a lesbian. And they sort of been through her coming out. And by this point, they were like, yes, they loved Carol too. They met her and she is a remarkably wonderful person. We actually met them at an anti-Klan rally uh, in Hartford, Connecticut, and they really liked her. And we all went out to Indian dinner afterwards and um, they approved. So the culture had not really shifted on that yet. It has shifted now as more and more people are out. And then it's interesting to me, the court this, well, I guess it was the Warren Court in the 60s. In 1967, they were way ahead of the public on interracial marriage. I think at the time that they made that ruling, still probably 90% of people were opposed, but they made the ruling, which helped bring people along. On same-sex marriage, I mean, I think the court was pushed more because there had been so much activism around marriage equality. Um. So, Joan, I mean, no, I'm, so that's a really interesting picture that you paint, and you, of course, you paint it uh, even more so in the book. But I want to ask, you know, I'm, I'm struck by your referencing to the fact that your parents moved, or your mum moved, shifted from we should have you committed, you must be out of your mind, really in a matter of, as you put it, a couple months to seeming to be okay. What do you think, mm -hmm. how, how, how did that, what helped them to move and to become, uh, come to your side as it were, yeah. to become more activists? What do you think, was it, I mean, was it proximity? Brian Steven talk, Stevenson talks about proximity. What, what do you think it was? I think it was love. They just loved me so much. And they saw that I was okay, that I was happy. You know, the world didn't explode when we got married. Um, I think they loved me also. This is really big. You know, 1962, we were really in a very explosive civil rights movement. So much was happening every month with demonstrations and the, the sit-ins had been going on while well, that started in 1960. So much had been happening that I think even over a period of months, a lot of people in the culture probably changed aside from love for a family member. You know, there was pretty rapid shift then. I think more and more people, um, people were reading James Baldwin. 
I mean, they were just an explosion of literature, but I think what was happening on the TV screens was moving people and they just, more white people saw the unjustness and maybe saw more of black people as people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe through literature as well as um, the news. And then they got to know Julius. And was this something that you ever talked to them about or that you, Julius talked to them about or, mm -hmm. or, or was it just a... Uh, I don't you know. It's sort of shocking now to think and I wish that they were still alive and we could talk about it now. I don't think we, I don't recall any particular conversations. Mm -hmm. I think I inched back to them and, and they completely embraced me mm -hmm. is kind of the feeling that I have about it. And then I'm just curious with, you know, equality around same sex marriage, the, the, mm -hmm. the argument, one of the things that was brought up for interracial marriages or opposition to it was children. And I, and I know that as well from my own background, my own grandparents, oh, you know, you're going to have interracial, you know, colored children. Mm -hmm. um, but was the children thing ever brought up around same sex marriage in that, oh, how can you have children or, or, or was it not so much a concern? Well, not so much for me. Well, my children were already yeah. young teens by that point. Um, it certainly has been in the culture brought up and same-sex parents had to prove through many studies after study that in fact their children turned out just fine and were just as well adjusted and, and they didn't all become gay. You know, so they weren't being indoctrinated. Um, yeah, so that wasn't really an issue for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Joan, as I said earlier, you, you've been such an incredible activist all of your life. And so on one level, this book is a story of your activism around civil rights and women's rights. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what it is like to come out with a book like this um, at this time, so-called racial reckoning moment in America and somewhat around the world perhaps, but also in the age of Me Too, um, you deal, you talk a lot about uh, being a woman and even, even just, for example, your, your mother saying we'll have to commit you. I wonder how many parents said that to their sons <laughs> it oh just seems it seems to be a particular thing <laughs> yeah. for women um so yeah so what is it like bringing mm. this book out at this time well <laughs> life can be so amazing because when i began this book about six years ago of course i didn't know what moment this would be and what environment i'd be bringing it out to and it seems like a very welcoming environment. So many white people right now are just wonderfully ravenous to read books about racism to understand and white parents are having uh, anti-racism parent groups. I gave the book to a gynecologist I went to recently for a first visit and she tucked it under her arm immediately and said, oh, I'm going tonight to a group of doctors. We're starting a book club about racism and we're all white and I can't wait to show this book. So it just seems like that's happening everywhere here. This doctor that I'd just been to and my, you know, all my neighbors are starting book clubs for white parents and um, and interracial groups are meeting more to have cross racial dialogues um, and the women's movement kind of crescendoing again in the last few years with Me Too and Time's Up. So I feel like there's an awareness now. I mean, the president of the United States is talking about structural racism. 40 years ago when I was doing workshops on structural racism, I mean, most white people just couldn't even believe that that was true. No, but the laws have changed. What are you talking about? And it would take like a whole day of um, document A, document B, document C to convince people. So uh, this is, I think we're really in a watershed moment, Sarah, with 
um, Black Lives Matter movement and the whole, every board it seems like is trying to suddenly diversify their membership. And it used to be, oh, we have, we have, we have, we have, you know, X, Y, Z people amongst our 4,000 white people. So, you know, look, we have some diversity, but people didn't really talk about it. At, at our white leaders didn't at different levels of organizations. So I think culturally, it's a fantastic moment to be bringing this book out. And I have to say, this is my sixth book. I have never gotten multiple emails a day every single day. I mean, it's been what, three weeks, four weeks since the book's been out of readers, from readers, many of whom I know and some of whom I don't know, just saying, this is so raw, it's so real. I can see my own life in there. This is from women, um, women who feel they were thwarted in some ways because the subtext of the book is me wanting to be a writer. And like many women of my generation, I wanted to be a writer. So what did I do? I married a writer because I didn't know how to be a writer. And he, although he had never published a word when I met him, and I had actually published an essay when I was 14 and won a prize, I would never call myself a writer. He, the first day I met him, said, I'm a writer. And I was like, oh, wow, a writer. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I did learn from him in a way more about how to be a writer because he did start getting published pretty quickly after we married. What was the question? I feel like I've gone a bit afield. <laughs> I think I think you you I may, think, you I may be you're... getting a bit of an echo. I don't know <laughs> if that's me, but you maybe did learn from him as a writer, but you certainly helped him I... as a writer. You edited a lot of his work. Uh, All of it. Yes. Um, <laughs> and luckily, he did acknowledge it, even a little he bit. Did. For some of a his lot, work. he acknowledged. He did. I think all of his forwards acknowledged me very graciously and, and full heartedly. Joan, I want to ask you about your evolution as an activist. You've, you've been involved in activism for many decades. And I, I think I'm particularly interested in, are you still evolving? Have you, for, let, let's come right to the present day. Um, in this moment of racial reckoning in America, are you still learning things? Oh my gosh, I could weep right now because it's been so stunning to me. I, I've been doing this as my life work, Sarah, for 60 years now, doing anti-racism work of one kind and another. And that's really been my, I would say my, the central passion of my life. I. Um, I started an institute with Carol, my life partner, now wife, uh, called Equity Institute, where we did workshops and trainings for nonprofits and then eventually for corporations around the country. I've given keynotes, I've read every book of my six books with races at the center. So, I mean, hello, am I a woke white woman? I would have said, oh, yes. But I feel that this year, and this is what brings me to tears, that I almost know, well, I, I don't say I almost know nothing. I, I know a lot, but there's so, so much I don't know. And one of the things I really did not fully appreciate was the white supremacist conditioning inside of myself. You know, I've been quick to talk about white supremacy but to actually see it, I, it's not that it's the first time I've noticed it in myself, but I can see it more and more. My habit of taking charge, you know, if I'm in a meeting of a group of people, well, I'm very competent. I just expect that I would speak up quite a lot and have to monitor myself a bit sometimes. Um, and that I wasn't raised with a habit of learning to listen carefully to a lot of other voices of people from very different backgrounds. I mean, that's something I've taught myself to do. 
but it's a that's a very much of an evolving process. And when I say I could just weep because it feels like it's almost in every cell and I'm squeezing it out cell by cell so that I'm listening more than ever. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I, that's telling. I really, I really appreciate you sharing that. And it's very, um, yeah, it's a profound sharing. And um, I think it's also a lesson to all of us that no matter how much experience we have, where we're coming from, it behooves us all to keep listening and keep learning. Um, and no matter how old we are or how young we are, we're always learning. Mm -hmm. um, Can I say more about that, Sarah? I read um, Claudia Rankin's book this year, Justice. Just, well, no, how does she say it? Just, Just us. us. Just us, which allies to justice. And at first I was kind of annoyed with her because she's just going through every page. So every little interaction she has with a white person and she's just noticing all the little subtleties of their um, supremacist behavior. And then I became very profoundly grateful to her for having such a thick hide and a stamina that she could keep doing this and sort of flay herself open to reveal to for her readers, you know, something very profound. Mm. I, you know, I, yeah, I, I want to actually flag something for Moad. We, I did a conversation with Claudia about that book. I, um, I saw that. And, I and watched may, that. maybe we can put that up as a link if the audience is interested. Um, it is, and again, I think it's great that you are honest enough to say yeah, that the book irritated you. <laughs> uh, and it's hard. It's hard to it's hard to be humble and take that step back and and recognize things, um, especially when your platform has been all these years that, you know, about anti racism and so forth. And also, and I think especially this is comes to the many levels in the book, but especially as someone who had to really struggle in a way to get your voice out as a woman. Mm -hmm. um, and then just, you know, sometimes having to stay, take steps back. So um, I really appreciate you sharing mm -hmm. that. I want to pivot. Can I just say before Ooh. you pivot mm -hmm. that I thought that was a wonderful conversation you did with her. She, I had see, I actually saw several interviews of her with other people as well. And she was by far the most relaxed with you. And I felt like you got to a deeper level. So, you know, well, thank you. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Maybe it was just, it was just the day, but um, no, no, no it was you. But okay, go on. <laughs> so I want to pivot a little bit and talk about memoir. I'm going to read a sentence or two that you wrote in one of the essays that you've uh, written recently, and I see that in the chat we have links to some of your recent essays, which are great. So I'd encourage people to read those too. And you say a memoir, and I'm quoting you. A memoir, like any other book, is a deliberately created piece of art, using in this case, with this book, one's life as the clay. But there are endless possibilities for shaping the raw material. What is the theme, the voice, which events to include, which to highlight, and how to connect them all? So I want to ask, how did you decide on the structure? And again, for those who haven't read it yet or haven't got their copy, you can maybe talk about how you drawn on your love of literature, each chapter is the title of a book. So how did you land on the particular structure mm -hmm. for this memoir? Well, it took, I don't know how many drafts um, to get to this structure. Like many books, you know, I always say to uh, writing clients, I used to work as an editor with writing clients, books aren't written, they're rewritten. Because as the reader, we pick up a book and it just looks so well organized and you can't imagine that it wasn't always in this form. But believe me, it wasn't. And this book, like others, started out, I, I was really writing about myself wanting to be a writer. That was the first theme. And so it was kind of logical 
since writing and reading and literature has been so important to me my whole life that I would land on the structure of naming each chapter. There are 32 chapters and each one is named for a book or a, in most cases a book, sometimes a poem or play that deeply influenced me at the time, but not only me, most of them were very much cultural touchstones for people in that era. So I had that, but it took a while, many conversations with many people uh, and a wonderful agent who hired, she actually was wonderful, gracious enough to hire editors for me to go through many drafts. Anyway, eventually I, got, I landed on the theme of the marriage to Julius as providing kind of the you know, the it's like I always say the first sentence of a book should be like an arrow that you shoot through the book and that's your theme and you, the spine of the book. You just stick with that and everything else has to fall around that. So I had to take out many chat. There are other wonderful things that I've been. I had a great trip to Cuba um, picking potatoes for the revolution, you know, many, many decades ago. And I had to leave out that chapter. I had a national TV program for multicultural, a multicultural program for children. I had to leave that out. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of childhood chapters and about my parents and my family that I've, th this book that you see in your hands, if you have it in your hands, is probably about a third of what I wrote. Uh, and I, I often say that to people about memoir because I think most people and possibly including myself when I began this, think how hard could a memoir be? You were there, you know what happened. So just write it down as if it's just a script kind of landing from the sky. I just have to remember what I did on that day and write it down and then I have a book. Well, actually I did write a memoir 40 years ago that um, blessedly never got published because the, it was that, it was like, I did this and then I did that and then I did that. And it was such a boring book. Where's the drama? What's your theme? Um, and you, you, the way you have, you've structured the book very nicely. And uh, so bravo, brava. <laughs> um, I want to ask another, question related to memoir though and it just so happens that I'm slowly making my way through Maria Stepanova's book In Memory of Memory and oh. I believe the book was written first in Russian so it's a translation and I've been thinking a lot about memoir recently myself and one of the questions that I'm fascinated by and perhaps even more so now that I'm reading this particular book is the kind of ephemeral nature of sort of memory and remembrances and how do you know that you're remembering something correctly the fallibility I guess of memory or the subjectivity so I, I I'm curious to ask you you've just you know, you've written a memoir yeah. that you didn't publish many years ago, and then you've written this, and uh, you've written other nonfiction books. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. The slipperiness, as it were, of memory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I grasp for what the best truth that I can find. And I did put a little disclaimer, the first sentence of the book is something that even before, I don't know, right after the title page saying something, this is true to the best of my memory. One of the strange things about writing one's own memories is that once you've captured it in print and worked with it, and that's kind of been the clay that you've molded into now a little piece of art, that scene, it's very hard if not impossible to get back to the unvarnished memory because now the memory is what I've written. And then it makes me almost question, oh, well, all I can remember is now what I've written, 
but did that really happen? So fortunately, I sent the book in late draft stages to many, to everybody that is mentioned in the book for corroboration. Um, and one of them was Julius, my ex-husband, and waited with bated breath. And he very graciously read it that night and emailed me a lot, many long emails actually the next day saying that he, he corroborated my memory of our marriage. Mm -hmm. And he didn't dispute anything that I said that he said or I said. Uh, and I did the same with every other person. So that was one helpful thing, but that doesn't necessarily get to the heart of what you're asking. And I think we just have to trust that we remember something that happened. It made an impact inside of us. And whether what we end up writing is the literal truth of I said this, he said that, I went out the door first, then he followed. You know, we're creating a, a dramatic scene there. Whether or not we've got every detail right, we do remember, I think, the emotional part of it. Mm. And then we create, and I, I understand that no memoir is the literal truth. I mean, it is, again, it's a work of art. You, you could say, to almost like, um, you know, sometimes a movie will say based on a true story. Mm -hmm. That's almost what a memoir is. And I first understood this when I wrote the biography of Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, because in the process of writing, I realized I could write any of dozens of biographies and they would all be true. Mm -hmm depending A, on what I focused on. You know, she's a legal scholar, she's a congresswoman, she was a civil rights advocate. You know, I could choose any theme, but also my attitude toward the material. So during the process of writing this memoir, my attitude toward Julius and myself changed. Mm. I think I started it still, I thought I had really forgiven him for things that I thought he should be forgiven for, his transgressions, but I don't think I had completely. And I got a lot more compassion for him and the pressures that he faced in our marriage with so many of his civil rights comrades saying, you can't be talking black and sleeping white. That was just a huge slam on him. Um, and that was one, one among other kind of pressures that he had. And I had more compassion for myself because I have over the years been sometimes um, felt recriminatory toward myself. Why wasn't I the kind of wife that could tolerate an absent husband for years at a time and raise my children you know, valiantly on my own and, and be very loving about it? Instead, I was mostly you know, very pissed off and, and let him know it. And I, you know, I had more compassion for myself too. So there's a memory of what happened, but there's also in the process of writing, we change. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I'm just more compa and I'm maybe a, just a more compassionate person at this stage in my life, mm -hmm. and more loving and more forgiving of everybody. Mm -hmm. But that came through. So that's another question about memory. What do you remember when you're 40 or when you're 50? And I'm now 81. What do I, who have I become now as the, you know, the repository of these memories? I will approach them in a different way than I did at 40 or 50 or 60 or 70. Well, I think that's a wonderful silver lining that you've just highlighted of writing memoir and mm -hmm. how. Um, it's been kind of had been a bonus to you in terms of mm -hmm. uh, being more forgiving of self and, and more as mm -hmm. you were describing. Was there anything in talking to others that you realized you had misremembered, which was an interesting story in and mm -hmm. of itself? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think with Julius, <laughs> I felt like he never did any childcare. 
And he reminded me, and I did put this in the book. I did put this in the book that for the first six months of our daughter's life, while I was in graduate school, he took care of her. I was at City University in a doctoral program. And um, he said he, he did the child care before when she was six months old. <laughs> He moved south to work with SNCC and fulfill his revolutionary duty. But I had forgotten that. So I thought, oh, that's really interesting that, you know, the scrim of my resentment had been so strong that I hadn't remembered what he actually did do. Mm-hmm. So that was really nice to remember that. Mm. No, that's a great example. I, I found myself thinking about those as well recently as well. And just it's interesting how it, it changes <laughs> the story. Um, so, Joan, you've hinted at this earlier, actually, at the beginning, being in the beginning of the conversation, you talked about how you feel that this is a very uh, optimistic, you, you're very optimistic and you end your book on a very optimistic note. And I wondered if you, I, I want to make sure we save enough time for any questions, but mm-hmm. want to ask you again, how you're feeling about this present time. And, mm-hmm. you know, you ended your book on a note of optimism are you still feeling that way? Oh, I do, I do, I do. I think that we've got maybe, maybe, maybe the best chance since Reconstruction to really change some basic structures in this country. I mean, just the kind of discussions that reparations, I mean, up until this past year, that was such a far out idea. It was never gonna happen. And it's moved in the national conversation a little bit more. I wouldn't say it's in the center now, but people are having these conversations. And aren't there some, trying to think, some cities now or some and some organizations? Um, And I think George Washington, is it George Washington um, University has now uh, said that as part of their reparations for owning slaves, they're giving... I don't remember the specifics, but certainly. Yeah, but they're doing, I mean, that, that, um, that language is now, it's part of the national conversation, as well as is structural racism. Um, So I, I think, as I had indicated earlier, the fact that the discussion has penetrated so many levels of society that I think the white will that, um, was eroded very fast during the last reconstruction may be there, you know, to push us forward against, you know, the resistance is always going to be there. And it certainly is, i.e. the January 6th insurrection and so on. But I think, um, I think enough of the majority opinion and the Black Lives Matter movement has gotten so strong and so wide and so deep led, I must say, by women of color, uh, you know, who initiated the movement and in many cases are in leadership. And th- that's been a significant change from the last, the last civil rights movement that I was involved in in the 60s. The big five or something, the leaders were all men. Yes. And this is a very different. So I think in terms of the gender um, difference in leadership, we're in a, a better place to be able to have more, uh, cooperative coalition building. Mm-hmm. I think we're in a, a good place. That, I mean, that's horrible to say while well, people are being murdered every day, black people by police, and they're not all captured on video, but I, that's been happening forever. That, that's <laughs> not new. So now it's being um, recorded more, noted more. And I see a lot of movement. It's certainly an opportunity and uh, let's hope it's really seized on and really takes root, as you say. Uh, We don't want a repeat of the reconstruction period all those many years ago um, where things are rolled back really quickly. Uh, So I just say to the audience to encourage you to ask your questions Uh of Joan. (laughs) We have uh, a question or two already. So, and Elizabeth has asked, Joan, you've been at the center of so many pivotal movements. What do you see as the next major frontier of human rights? Oh my goodness. 
Uh, well, certainly um, gender fluidity and the, the right of people to determine their own gender. Um, you know, is right there on the edge and witness all the, how many state laws are being passed uh, right now, you know, basically tar targeting transgender youth. Um, I think it's like 17 states. It's really horrible, but I, I think that's a frontier. And I just have to say, I think race, we can't say, well, we need some new issue. I mean, race is still front and center mm -hmm. to me and gender and gender i was i've just been thinking i don't have the latest statistic at all but why aren't we talking more about how many women are murdered every we used to say like every four minutes every four seconds you know a woman's being beaten a woman's being murdered um and we need i think we need to heighten that awareness again too the violence against women mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i think so just all of those are still up i'm sorry go ahead no, I'm just adding to what you're saying. I think the right to have an education, the right to have health care, the right to have a roof over one's head. I think they're basic, you know, human mm -hmm. rights and equality that we, you know, these are not new frontiers, but they uh, still really need a lot of attention. Um, so just really adding to what you're saying. Thank you. Um, so we're getting uh, notes of thanks to you. Um, uh, I think it's Reverend Dr. Jamie. So thank oh, you. For, thank you for being my. Colleague. Excuse thank me, you. an old colleague. Go ahead. I'm sorry. So they're thanking you for being their role model, mentor, and friend. And oh. the the question that they're asking is, what do you see as the role of spirituality in moving us forward for the next mm -hmm. round? Oh, very interesting. Well, I, after not having understood anything about spirituality, my own or anything about it for the first 40 years of my life, have been uh, exploring that more and more. And it certainly helps keep us more grounded and more understanding that we are all one. You know, we, we've said for a long time, well, we're all one human species, but I think when we understand that in spirit, we are all manifestations, each person, you know, of some bigger spirit, whether we want to call it a spiritual entity or just spirit, um, that is very helpful in allowing us to figure out how to, to be together on this planet. Um, so I guess I'm still evolving in that arena and understanding how spirituality can undergird social justice movements. I've certainly been avidly following Reverend Barbara Barber and um, really admiring his work and seeing that the way that he ties spirituality to social justice um, and uses that and certainly in the civil rights movement there was a very spiritual base for the whole, what I regarded at the time as a mere tactic of nonviolence, but I'm understanding more and more now that it was a lot more than a tactic. Great. Uh, we have maybe time for one or two more questions. And I see uh, that uh, someone named Joan Peters has asked what impact did the Black Power Movement have from mm -hmm. 1968 on you. Um, it's interesting. I mean, sometimes I feel some of these questions, we need a bigger conversation. We need to hear mm -hmm. more from the person who's asking the question because uh, Joan Peters goes on to say, it stopped my desire as a white person to get involved mm -hmm. in the struggle for rights for black people. Um, you know, I'd like to ask more about what their understanding <laughs> of the black power movement was and so forth. But anyway, th there's the question for you to take as mm -hmm. you wish. Um, well, it um, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, around that time, maybe it was 67 or 68, expelled white people from the organization. But they had a very uh, good point. They said, white people go out and organize in your own communities, because that's where the problem 
is originating from. You know, it's really fun to, as a white person, to go hang out with black people and, you know, dance and sing. And, um, well, I mean, I'm caricaturing us. We did a lot more than dance and sing together, but I mean, just ha hanging out and marching together and feeling all that solidarity. But the, the uh, I guess the impact that that had on me was like, okay, I kind of took the instruction. And then I began, uh, not too long after that, organizing workshops just for white people for a few years to work on our own racism and to strategize for change. What can we do using our relative power? White people always say, well, I don't have any power. Well, yes, you do, we do. And how can we leverage that? So that was the impact it had on me. Thank you, thank you, Joan. And thank you, Joan, for the question. Um, so we have a few more minutes. I, I'm going to ask you one more question. And if anyone wants to get their last question in, you have just about enough time. Joan, what next? For me? Mm. On the writing front. Oh my goodness. Well, I'm so up to here right now with, you know, being doing events for this book. I did have another book that I actually had a contract for before I started this memoir. And it was a sequel, uh, I, my young adult novel, Black, White, Other. Um, I wrote a sequel called Langston Hughes and the One True Me that I really like. And my editor really liked it too, enough to buy the book, but um, she didn't like the first few chapters. And I rewrote the first few chapters many times and she, still was not convinced by the character. So I think, uh, and then I put it aside, I was tired of it. So I put it aside and spent six years on this memoir. So I kind of feel like I need to go back to that book because it's 90% done. Um, so I probably will, but I have to say, I've kind of got the memoir bug too now. And I've thought about various other themes that I could pursue. So I don't know. Um, well, I'm sure we'd all love to read more of your memoir projects. We, <laughs> someone has just written, this is Anne-Marie Booth, please read some of the chapter titles and I will do that. Uh, just to highlight a few of the chapter titles in themselves are highlighting seminal works from the souls of black folk to things fall apart to the autobiography biography of Malcolm X to the second sex, et cetera, et cetera. And in some of the chapters, you really make reference to the text that you're referring to and others, it's more abstract, um, but they're all great and interesting books in their own ways. Um, so we have a, um, a Chebe, love that first name, Powell is asking, will this interview be available in recorded form? video, Elizabeth will come on in a second and let us know, but I think the answer to that is yes. Joan, I just want to thank you again from all of us for taking the time to be with us, for writing this book, for being so honest and insightful in terms of what you've shared with us today. And thank you, what better way to celebrate the on the eve of the loving day, the loving versus Virginia decision. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And someday, I hope to meet you in person. We will make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so much for this really um, interesting and provocative conversation. Um, and I hope that those of you out there who haven't already purchased the book are inspired to purchase it and, um, and read Joan's memoir about this really amazing life and time that she spent um so you can purchase the book through moad's online website and uh they put links to that in the chat um i i hope that you all have a wonderful day and that you find your own way to celebrate loving day tomorrow and thank you for allowing us to start a little bit early today joan and sarah oh. thank um, you yeah thank you elizabeth thank you so much for organizing this so please um, 
do if you uh, if you are able, we would love to have you support MOAD. I put links in the chat again to ways that you can support MOAD. You can support MOAD by purchasing Joan's book, of course, or by becoming a member of the museum. And um, you can also come to other programs at MOAD. We have many online programs, so you can check that out at moadsf.org. Thank you all and have a beautiful weekend. Bye.